Well, it's uh, good to be with you this morning. Uh, I, you know, uh, just so you know, uh, Ben was talking about my opportunity to blog and be on Twitter. Uh, I love being behind my computer and writing and communicating. This is probably one of the biggest crowds I've ever been in front of in my speaking life. And so, you know, Jonathan comes out, talks about being tasered and possibly wetting his pants. <laughs> it's a little frightening for me right now, just in case you're wondering. Uh, and golly, Jonathan, he's, he's quite the man going after Perry Noble and Benny Hinn in the same, uh, same sentence. He's got to watch out. Perry might punch him in the throat. I don't... Uh, this morning, uh, we're going to have a fun conversation in a bit. I'm going to invite some of you to participate in the conversation. Uh, but what we're going to be talking about is uh, it's a little bit different than what I normally hit. Uh, because uh, part of who I am is I'm just passionate about people in our culture coming to know the person of Jesus because I've seen the life transformation that's happened in my life, in the life of my family and friends. Uh, kind of a sad moment for my family and I, just in the last few days, one of our good friends from uh, our time at New Spring Church passed away on Sunday. And being a part of the celebration was phenomenal. Uh, we were uh, very encouraged by that. But again, in me, it just uh, cr increased the sense of urgency that I have for helping people uh, come to know Jesus because uh, life, life is too short. But today, uh, I want to talk to you about what happens after people connect with our churches. What, what does that look like? And uh, for me, I think about ministry uh, as an opportunity to help people take their next steps toward Christ. Uh, I'm a strategist, and so I often am helping churches figure out what is your ministry strategy, or what is your discipleship strategy. And quite simply, initially I'm helping churches figure out if people connect with your church, and of course they connect with our churches at, at all different levels of spiritual maturity, or some people are still checking out the claims of Christ, but they connect with our churches at one spot, and then ultimately everything that we're helping them to do is to help them take their next step toward Christ, right? And what our objective is, I'm assuming, is to help people ultimately become fully devoted followers of Christ. Now, uh, push the pause button just for a second. Uh, I'm going to give you some practical things that you can do when you leave the whiteboard sessions. Won't this be fun? Uh, the first thing you will want to do is at some point sit down with your ministry team, uh, get in front of a whiteboard, have your Bibles in hand, and figure out in our ministry what does a fully devoted follower of Christ look like. Now, here's what's a little bit frightening about this, is in our minds I think we all have a picture of what that looks like, but ultimately, as churches or as ministries, we, we, we've really never discussed that. And as a result of that, everything that we do between helping, a, helping somebody initially connect with our church and then take steps to become a fully devoted follower of Christ, everything that we do in between, we're, we're just doing it. But sometimes I wonder if we're doing it with any intentionality. And then ultimately, I think we need to ask the question, is everything we're doing helping us get the results, which is to help people become fully devoted followers of Christ. So that's what I'm going to talk about today. Now, uh, here's the deal. When I, when I uh, am engaged in ministry with churches, and when I go out and co consult and coach with churches, I don't have a magic formula for what needs to happen between point A and point B. I, I, don't, I don't know what that's like for your church. And the reason I say that now is because I've come in contact with so many churches that I've seen God blessing amazing leaders in, in unique cultures and unique environments. And as a result of that, churches look very different, and that's a good thing, because there are lots of different people that we're trying to reach. And so I can't tell you specifically what needs to happen between point A and point B, but I think we need to get more intentional about what that looks like. Because here's the deal. Uh, for most churches, uh, when people connect to our church, they're also trying to figure out, how do I take my next step toward Christ? Now, in churches, though, uh, we have all of this ministry programming that we're trying to offer. It's services, it's classes, it's events, it's groups, 
all of this ministry programming is, exists in, in this uh, space between point A and point B. But the problem is, I think for the person that's connecting with our churches, they're looking at all those opportunities and they're confused. They're not quite sure what they should do next. And I think part of the reason why is that's the, that's the way God designed us. Uh, there's been some res research in, in years past taking a look at how we process decisions. And uh, some folks from Columbia University went into a grocery store and they did some taste tests. In one, in one instance, they, they uh, provided 24 varieties of jam. And in another instance, they only provided six varieties. Now, intuitively, we would think where you have more options, people are more likely to take a step, correct? Because we figure uh, there's going to be something that everybody will ultimately enjoy. So they did, they did the taste test, and as you would expect, more people stopped where there were 24 options of jam to taste. However, the same number of people tasted the jams in both locations, but this was what was interesting, again, about, and this gives us a picture of how God des has designed our brains. Where there were six options of jams, 30% of the people actually made a purchase. But where there were 24 options, only 3% made a purchase. And so what's happening, I think, is uh, for folks connecting in our churches, they're looking at all of these options for ministries, all of these options for next steps, and my fear is there's kind of a paralysis of analysis that's taking place. It's not about a purchase in this instance. People are generally try trying to figure out how do I take my, take my next step toward Christ, but they're stuck. They're not quite sure what to do. Uh, recently, I got on, a, uh, got on the web because I was curious to look at uh, you know, how, how are churches appro approaching ministry and how are churches helping uh, people take their next steps. And I went onto a, a church website. This church is very, very far away from where we're located. I'm sure it, it, no one from that church is in this room. But I thought it might be helpful for you just to get a sense of how we as a church are trying to connect people in their faith journey. So I wrote down samples of next steps I could take at this church. Let, let me read them. Uh, there was a parent's night out a precept class, a financial stewardship class, a, min a mystery trip if I were a senior adult, which I'm getting closer, a women's ministry, me men's ministry, a choir rehearsal, orchestra rehearsal, divorce care, a Bethmore Bible study. I mean, what good church doesn't have a Bethmore Bible study? <laughs> there was a grief share support group, singles ministry gatherings, kids ministry on Sundays, Awana on Wednesday evenings, homeschool ministry, mothers of preschoolers, a newborn ministry, a vacation Bible school, child dedication, summer camps, they were promoting a music festival, a Sunday morning gathering for students, and then a Wednesday evening gathering for students. There were small group opportunities, volunteer opportunities, homebound ministry, four different options for uh, foreign mission trips, rescue ministries, pregnancy support ministries, there was a jail ministry, a medical ministry, a food pantry, sports ministry, homeless ministry, celebrate recovery, there were church planting opportunities, an orphan care ministry, uh, wait for it, a quilting ministry, um, a nutritious, uh, they had nutritious cooking lessons available, evangelism training, handyman ministries, counseling, uh, disaster relief teams, discipleship uh, training, soldier care, prayer ministry, membership classes, a Wednesday evening fellowship meal, three options for Sunday morning services, and then a Spanish service. Now, here's the deal. Again, I have no idea what the formula is for your church, okay? I, I have no idea. And honestly, I could probably make a case for any one of those ministries to help people, well, with the exception of the quilting ministry. I'm not <laughs> sure if I can do that. I could probably make a case for any one of those ministries to help people take their next step towards Christ. But my concern is, I think we're trying to do too much. And our sense is that as the church grows, we, we need to offer more options for ministry so that we have more options for people to take their next step. And my concern is we're just confusing people. They're trying to make a decision. They want to do the right thing, but they're stuck. And we're causing them to be stuck. Do you see my concern? 
And I think the big question we need to ask is, are we really helping people to become fully devoted followers of Christ? Now, here's the trap we fall into as church leaders. I'm a numbers guy. I love numbers. And I think we need to embrace looking at numbers to monitor the health of our churches. But the challenge for us is it's really easy to measure activity at our church. It's, it's much harder to measure actual life change. But it can be done. And we, we need to begin to pour uh, our, our heart and our minds into figure out how do we figure out if life change is really happening in our church? Uh, maybe through stories, uh, maybe there are some measures, maybe periodically survey, I don't know what it is. But ultimately, we need to begin asking the question, is what we, uh, is what we are doing impacting people's lives? Are they ultimately becoming fully devoted followers of Christ? Now, here's what I've done. I've, I've, uh, because of uh, our time constraints and because I know you all are diligently wanting to take down everything that I'm saying this morning because you are good students of Tony Morgan, uh, here's what I've done for you. Uh, I'm going to run through a list here, uh, and I've already put the list on my website. So you can try to take notes if you want. It'll make me feel good if I see you writing stuff down. But I'm going to give you a list here, and if you don't catch it all, it's all on the website. So you can check that out. All right, so the question you might be asking is, here, we're doing a lot of stuff at our church. How do, we, how do we find focus? What are some questions that we could ask to make sure we're finding focus in our ministry to help people take their next steps? So here are four questions. Again, this would be a great conversation for you to have with your ministry team. Here's, here's the first question. What event or program requires a major platform announcement in order for it to succeed? Because, you know, if it were really adding value to somebody's life, wouldn't they want to be there? And wouldn't they want to invite their friends to participate as well? Here's another question. What would you not participate in if you weren't the pastor? <laughs> that, that'll, be, that'll be a good conversation right there. Uh, here's another question. Does this program reach people outside the church, or is it just in place to satisfy people inside the church? Okay, now, again, we need programs for people inside the church because we're trying to help them take their next steps toward, toward Christ. But my question is, does every ministry in the church have to do that? Can we have some ministries in our church that are trying to reach people outside the faith? Uh, here's another question. Where is the fruit? What is God blessing? And what would happen if we poured more of our prayer, our energy, our financial resources, our leadership, our volunteers, what would happen if we began to focus more of our resources that God has blessed us with into the things that he's actually blessing? So the question uh, is, are we really, uh, are, are people really becoming fully devoted followers of Christ? Now, but this leads us to the uh, second part of the conversation this morning, and it all has to do with if we come to a place where we've clarified our discipleship strategy, is it being clearly communicated? And here's the fun thing. We're going to plant a church this morning. How about that? We're going to plant a church, and I need some people to help lead the church. And so we, we need to do this quickly because of limited time. I need a teaching pastor, someone with teaching experience. Raise your hand. Come on. Quick, quick, quick. No one in the room has taught anything? Yes. You come up. Uh, I need someone that can sing to be our worship leader. Can anybody sing? Okay, yeah, you come up. We need to have a student pastor. Student pastor. Okay, there's a guy over here that uh, has something to do with uh, children's. Come on up to the platform, guys. Children's, anybody? Okay. Uh, we need groups. We're going to have groups at our church. Anybody been involved in group ministry? Okay, come on up. Uh, we, we're going to try to connect people into serving opportunities. Anybody done that? Oh, yes. Come on up. Uh, and let's see, what are, what are we missing here? Uh, we need to care for people. There are going to be hurting people coming into our church, and so we may need someone to do counseling or lead care ministries. Anybody done that? Okay, come on up. All right, so here, here's the deal. Um, we're, we're planning a church today. Isn't this great? And we've planted the church, and look how many people showed up already. I th I, well, you know what this means. This means Outreach Magazine is going to do an article on us pretty soon, so this is good. All right, so uh, who, who do we have here? Uh, Levi, what's your role? 
Um, I'm the group guy. Groups. Randy? Children. Children. Marty? Uh, teaching. Te uh, do you have your message prepared yet? Ready. Three points. Okay. All right. Tiny, are you yes. serious? Yes. And, and what is your role? I'm the worship pastor. You're the worship pastor. We need to audition him. Whoops, I'm sorry. We need to audition him. Do you happen to know pants on the ground? Yes. Oh, well, no, I won't make you sing that. Uh, that's a little American Idol thing there. Don't worry. Uh, Debbie? Serving. Serving. Uh, that's not your name, is it? It is today. What, uh, a sea bass. That's right. What's your role? Uh, student pastor. Student pastor sure. and? Counseling. Counseling, all right. Uh, if you wouldn't mind, uh, would you pray for him? Yes. Okay, all right. So here's the deal. Uh, we, we have our group of leaders here. Uh, we're, we're planting a church. We have our leaders. Have you noticed that we've really narrowed our fo focus? There are only eight, seven, I like numbers, there are only seven ministries represented here, okay? We've narrowed, we've, we've defined our, our discipleship strategy. We have seven leaders over those ministry areas. Now, here's what I know about you as leaders. Number one, you are very passionate about the specific area of ministry that you're responsible for, right? Uh, who, who's the kids minister? Randy, here's what I know about you, man. Um, when it comes to the kids... You know, we always need more volunteers in kids' ministry. That's it. The reason why, we don't want our kids going to hell, right? That's and it. so you need more help. Or, or messing up the rooms. You know, we don't want that either. So all of these people, very passionate about their ministry areas. Secondly, I know as leaders, if we gave them the opportunity, in their mind already, they're thinking about the one thing that they would want to communicate to the church to help people take their next step, right? Passion about your ministry you, you're, ready to, you're ready to lead people. You're ready to influence people. Okay, so here's what we're going to do. Are you thinking about that one thing that you would communicate? You have that one thing in mind? All right, on the count of three, I want you to share that with the church, okay? Here we go. One, two, three. Oh, my word. I, I thought we brought leaders on the stage. I'm not sure that we did. Come on now. You're passionate. I don't think they caught it, so it needs to be a little bit mm, with gusto this time. Here we go. One, two, three. Jesus! I think it's time to call in the elders. What do you think? All right. Uh, you tried. So uh, have a seat. I appreciate your assistance here. All right, while well, they're taking their seats, if the illustration wasn't painfully obvious to you, uh, what we had was a church that had clearly defined their discipleship strategy. There were only seven ministries represented here. But what they hadn't done is clearly defined how they're going to communicate that. And did you notice uh, when everybody started talking at the same time, when all the ministries started talking at the same time, it was confusing, wasn't it? And, you know, as leaders, of course, when our message isn't heard, our first objective then is to try to get louder with our message. This is why the student pastor makes big posters and they, and they make t-shirts and they, and they create flyers and, and, and fancy videos and things like that because the student pastor wants the student ministry message to be heard. And so what happens is in our churches, all of our ministries are trying to make their message louder so that their voice can be heard. And then what happened? It just got more confusing, didn't it? And that, friends, that's what's happening in our churches. Even if we narrow our discipleship strategy, we have to be very intentional about how it's being communicated or, not, or, or we're just creating confusion for the people that are hoping to take their next steps toward Christ. Now, uh, here's another list for you then. If, if that's the case, if, if what we're doing is, is basically creating noise in our ministry, how could we take some steps to avoid the noise? So here, here are five steps to help you avoid noise in ministry. The first one is you need to clarify what's the mission, vision, and values of your church. It needs to begin there. I'm praying that, that, that God has given someone in your church a clear mission and vision for what needs to happen next. Because if you don't have that clarity, how in the world can you have a clear message? The second thing 
you need to focus your discipleship strategy. You need to help people figure out what are those next steps going to be. And we talked about that already this morning. The third thing is you need to bring consistency to your message. It needs to sound like it's coming from the same church. There needs to be consistent, uh, you could throw out some marketing terms here. There needs to be consistent, consistency of branding or uh, consistency of voice. Uh, here, here's another exercise that you could do uh, with your ministry teams. For two weeks, accumulate every communication that goes out from your church. All church communications and ministry-specific communications. This is going to be an all-play. Everybody do that for two weeks. And that will include, include letters that go out, postcards that go out, email messages that go out. What else will that include? Um, uh, updates to the website, uh, Facebook updates, Twitter updates. Uh, someone's going to prepare a video to announce something in your service. Uh, whatever it is, however you might communicate with people in your church, accumulate that for two weeks. And then bring all of those samples into a room, try to put them on the wall around the room, and then bring your team in to, to kind of observe what's taking place. Here's my guess. A couple things that you're going to find. Number one, you're communicating an awful lot with folks in your church. And secondly, it's probably going to look like it's coming from multiple different organizations. So that'll be a fun exercise. Here's the crazy thing about that. You know, if we were in business, uh, every de let's say we were operating a Target, okay? Every department in Target would not be sending out information about their specific department. You know, you wouldn't have the men's clothing department sending out information about their line of clothes, and then the children's ministry department sending out information about their line of clothes, there would be some intentionality about communicating what's happening at the store from one point of contact. And it would always look like it was coming from Target. But in the church world, we don't do that. We, we all send out messages about everything that's happening in our churches. Everybody's smiling at me because this is so much like what's actually happening in your churches, isn't it? Uh, we all communicate this. Now, if a business were sending out all these messages from all different departments, do you know what they call that? Spam. That's right. They call it spam. In the church, we call it great ministry. In fact, <laughs> in fact we, we, we sometimes give our student pastors the raise if they're effective in their promotions, don't we? Uh, and that's why they spend so much time promoting what's happening in their ministry. Okay, uh, back to the list because I have limited time. Uh, number four is prioritize your message. And so uh, you'll have some ministries in your church that will be able to have something communicated from the platform on Sunday morning, and some ministries in your church that will never get something communicated from the platform on Sunday morning. And here's what you can tell the leaders of those ministry areas. Life isn't fair, and then you die. But again, if we're trying to communicate everything like it has the same value, I'm concerned about the person that's connecting with your church, trying to figure out how, are, how am I going to take my next step toward Christ. And what we're saying is all 50 ministries that we have are equally important. Well, people are, I'm guessing, I mean, you should ask again, but I'm guessing they're not going to be taking those steps. Number five is eliminate competing messages. Eliminate competing messages. I was out in California a few weeks ago, and a church leader said when they launch a ministry, whatever the ministry is, uh, they only commit to it for three years. At the end of three years, the ministry stops, unless they evaluate it and determine it's really helping a lot of people become fully devoted followers of Christ. Now, there's nothing magical about three years, um, but with intentionality, I think it's helpful for us to look at the ministries in our church and try to figure out, are we really helping people become fully devoted followers of Christ? And if not, why are we doing it? So there you go, five, five things to clarify your message. Which brings me to the story of the giant inflatable blue monkey. Are you familiar with the giant inflatable blue monkey? We might even have a picture of one. Do we have a picture of one? I think we might. Oh, look there. The giant inflatable blue monkey. Now, I live in the southeast. Um, you got to love the southeast. Uh, I feel right at home there. I'm not very mechanical. 
uh, but in the southeast it's a great thing because you can repair everything with duct tape and blue tarps. Uh, and so it's like, this, I, I was made for this location of the country. And I don't know, maybe you don't have them, but in the southeast it's typical to see the giant inflatable blue monkey. Typically, they show up in front of car dealerships. Uh, you know, I guess the thinking is, if we have an inflatable animal in front of our car dealership, we're going to sell more cars. In fact, I, I have pictured the uh, meeting on Monday morning at the car dealership. They're gathering in the conference room of the car dealership. Again, they've gone through a slow, day, a slow weekend of sales. They haven't sold many cars, and so the leadership of the car dealership is sitting in the conference room trying to figure out how in the world are we going to sell more cars, okay? And so they're sitting around trying to figure that out. One, one of the managers raises his hand and says, I got an idea. Why don't, why don't we build better cars? Oh, no, we can't do that. That would involve too much work. We can't do that. Uh, another, another manager at the car dealership and raises his hand and says, I got, a, I got another idea. Why don't we improve the customer experience at our dealership? No, that would be too hard. We can't do that. And then one sharp manager raises his hand and bravely asks this question. What if we would call the rental company and get ourselves a giant inflatable blue, blue monkey? Yeah, let's do that. The giant inflatable blue monkey. We're sure to sell cars. Now. Here's the deal. In your churches, the giant inflatable blue monkey is roaming the halls of your church. Only, it's not actually an inflatable animal. It's everything you do to promote ministry at your church. It's the platform announcement. It's, uh, let's see, it's the, the postcard that goes out in the mail. It's your email blasts. Um, it's your posters that you hang up on your bulletin boards. What else do we do? We, we create logos and fancy names for every ministry in our church. I, I, I get a kick out of this. Uh, men's ministry. We're uh, what, what, warriors for God. You know, and you get, you get a fancy t-shirt with the fancy warriors of God logo. Uh, and uh, we expect people that are coming to our church to, oh, warriors of God. That must mean men's, men's ministry. Let's go do that. So everything we're doing in our church is we're promoting next steps. It's the giant inflatable blue monkey. Now, here's the deal. I'm, I'm pretty confident that promoting better is not the key to helping people become fully devoted followers of Christ. Now, you all are a smart room here. What would you guess the number one reason is that people show up to our churches for the very first time? If they're going to come for a worship service, why do you think they come for the very first time? How, what gets them there? A friend invites them. In fact, I've done the research a couple different times and found that between 75 and 80 percent of people that showed up to the church for the very first time came because a friend invited them. Now, here's what's crazy. We know that that's how they get to our church here at point A. But once they get here, rather than assuming, well, it must be invest and invite, we go into promotion mode. We pull out the giant inflatable blue monkey. And so if we want them to go into a small group, blue monkey time. If we want them to attend an event, it's the blue monkey. If we want them to serve in ministry, we got to bring out the blue monkey, right? Isn't that the way it works? What would happen if instead of doing all that promotion in our ministry, what would happen if we tried to create ministry environments where life change was happening and then... What would happen if we just invested in relationships with people? What would that look like? Just wondering. Because, honestly, every step I've taken in, in the church has been because I have a friend that I want to be with. And a friend that has kind of pulled me along. And a friend that has encouraged me in my faith. And so, what would happen if we create environments where life change happens and we just encourage people to develop relationships. So my key thought today is uh, let's, let's not promote next steps in our church. Let's, let's create environments where life change happens and where people are investing in relationships and inviting their friends to engage that process. All right? That was fun, wasn't it?
I had a good time. All right, so uh, the great thing is uh, it's, it's also break time now, and so I think Ben is gonna come out and uh, help us transition to break. Won't that be fun? So Ben. I'll do it. <laughs> I'm gonna get to the next book, man. Oh, thanks. That was fun.